welcome. I'm Rich Slayton, joined by Joshua A.C. Sharon, Andrew Guy, and Jackson Juicy J. Wall. This is the 2022 Clash Royale League World Finals! Before we get into the action, Juicy, welcome to your first World Finals as a caster. You already won one back in the day. You won 50K when you did it. How does it feel to be on the other side of the screen? I'm feeling great. I'm really excited, but most of all, I want to watch these players play. We have the 16 best players in Clash Royale here competing for a million dollar prize pool. A million dollar prize pool, but to get there, you got to go through our tournament format. You guys know this is Clash Fest. This is World Finals. It's a three day event. Double elimination, upper bracket, lower bracket, best of three dual mode. You got to do it on the spot with only two minutes between each game. And of course, if you don't lose, if you're the last player standing, you get to walk away with with our massive prize purse, and of course, the title of the greatest Clash Royale player in the world. Now, Juice, you won 50K. That's a lot of money. There's a million dollars on the line. Yeah, it doesn't really compare, does it? Is there one match here that stands out to you more than the rest? Most of these matches have a favorite, an easy pick, but if there's one that stands out to me, it is Air Surfer versus Pandora. Very even matchup. Uh, that's the one I'm most excited to watch. We're ready for the action. Match one, day one, Clash Royale League World Finals. Let's go. I'm with Keith at the bottom, Sandbox at the top, rocking those added battle banners, which you can, of course, get battle banner points at event.clashroyale.com as you work through the weekend. Sandbox already nodding. He knows what he's going up against. Keith using a quick cycle deck here. Mighty Miner definitely going to be bait. Sandbox with a Ghost and a Barbaro, most likely going to be either a Mega Knight Bridge him. No, and Roll a Giant, that's classic Sandbox. That is absolutely correct. Sandbox does love Royal Giant, although he did play a lot more Drill, as did Keith. Both their favorite win conditions throughout the competition. But Sandbox does have a 75% win rate with Royal Giant in our CRL qualifiers this year. Hog behind the Mighty Miner. Maybe not exactly what we were expecting when we saw the first four cards, Juicy. Absolutely. The Cannon Cart Mighty Miner Hog deck is something that we've seen come into the meta more recently. The only big weakness to this deck is you don't have any air defense. So it looks like he was very, very confident in his ability to make sure he doesn't get an air matchup here. Yeah, Sandbox not a guy that really loves to play air. When you go back and you look at his deck history once again, he's only played Loon as his win condition one time in the entire run that he had in CRL this year. And of course, he played Lava three times with a 0% win rate. So I love that early deck pick from Keith. Shows that he's been doing his homework, but it's all about going from game one to game two. 27-35, bottom left-hand tower. 26-76 on the top right. Sandbox behind by just a hair. Yeah, that was really good defense from Sandbox. Going with immediate RG for that Mortar and then the Hunter right after to make sure to take out that Cannon Cart and then huge counter push. Keith did a really good job of defending that and then getting some nice Mighty Miner damage and a King Tower activation. So Keith has got to be feeling pretty well right now. Yeah, that was an incredible 10 seconds or so there for Keith. You saw Sandbox, you know, kind of shake his head when he placed that E Spirit too high, stuck his tongue out, probably not too happy about that. There's a lot of nerves being the first competitor of the day, your first match of World Finals. But remember, guys, this is day one. We are going to be eliminating four players today. So whoever loses this set will be sent down to the elimination bracket and fighting for their lives later on. Neither of them want to be in that position, but still a very even game here as we tick 40 seconds away from overtime. Mighty Miner Hog push on the left here. The Hog does get a very important shot, and now Keith is going to be up a significant amount of damage, about one Hog slash RG shot in the, uh, in the lead here. Log plus Spirit there keeps that Hunter off the tower. Juicy, this deck is, is, is relatively heavy on the back end, but you can see those first three cards going to help you get around pretty quickly. What is the goal with this deck when you're playing RG? How do you play through this matchup? I think the biggest thing here is Fisherman value. You want to get the Fisherman to pull in those cannon cards, pull in those Mighty Miners, because if you can't do that, you're never going to be breaking through. So Fish Boy here, not going to turn and grab that Mighty Miner, going to cross the bridge all by his lonesome. Meanwhile, the Mighty Miner is tanking for that Hog Rider. And just to go back to that moment of the Mist East Spirit that did allow that Mighty Miner Ability Bomb to get on top of Tower. Now we see a Barbell getting on top of the Mortar, RG on top of the Mortar. Royal Ghost not getting the tank that it needs because of that Cannon Cart. RG just in time getting on the Cannon Cart there. A bit of a blessing for Keith from that Lightning. Absolutely. 
Mortar not able to get in the shot, but That's the Hunter a big is. Hunter shot, 1395, 1966. Sandbox starting to pull away here. Now you see Keith shifting a little on stage, maybe getting a little bit less comfortable as we move forward. 80 seconds remain in the first match of the day. Yeah, he was in a really good spot. He was having some solid defense and always getting those hog shots. But it seems like the bats for Sandbox are really providing a lot of value. He only has the Ice Spirit to take care of those bats. And as we all know, it's almost impossible to hit all of them. And you see right there, Ice Spirit actually gets hit by the splash of that Royal Ghost. Royal Ghost goes invisible with the Royal Giant behind. This could be a lot of trouble for Keith. And look at the Fishermen. They're taking out that Mortar. The Candy Car is doing its best, but the Lightning is going to come down. And Keith needs a Mortar Connect right now if he wants to win this game. And you see again Sandbox tilting his head going, I'm not lightninging at the correct time because it keeps making my RG focus on that cannon once it's off of its wheels. 1908 to 997, 36 seconds remain. Another hog coming in here. The cannon car is locked The cannon's on. on the tower. The cannon's on the tower. The hog is late. I mean, the fisherman is late on the hog. hog two hits. The second hit is in. 628, 997. That was a huge moment for Keith. This is a huge counter push, though. If he can defend properly, he might have a chance to win this game. Vlog's going to knock this back. Lightning's going to come down. There fisherman he... pulls in that cannon car. Oh, but the Royal Giant gets frozen, and the mortar comes down in time. 680, 628, eight seconds remain. Eight seconds, it's so close. Here comes the hog. We're gonna see an earthquake and a log on this tower as well. There's the lightning. the lightning. The hit comes in. Keith takes game number one in a nail biter juice. Wow, what did I just witness? If the hog didn't get that shot, I don't think he was gonna be able to take that win, but he had just enough time. Later on, Sandbox was having such difficulty getting those lightnings where he needed because the cannon cart kept going off its wheels. RG would retarget. You get the ice spirit down if you need. I mean, what could he have done differently? Did he need to play more patiently? I think the biggest thing is just allowing that cannon cart to lock on. Yeah. That is where the game really shifted. If he could have just placed some sort of ground unit, like a ghost or a fisherman, to prevent that from happening, he could have been in a good spot to win that game. Let's take a look here at a replay. Mortar not able to get that shot. At this point, it is a base race. I really like Keith's understanding to go for the hog here in the last second because he knows that lightning does more damage than his earthquake does. And that is what punched him the game, that hog hit. And one of the things that I think was interesting is at the very beginning of that game, you said, Pretty typical for Sandbox to run Royal Giant in game number one. Yes, it is one of his favorite win conditions. Yes, it is one of his most successful win conditions. But if you're here at World Finals, if you're in that dual mode, you have to be a little bit less predictable. And I love that you called out. He had no air defense. I think the other big thing in that matchup was how, I mean, you mentioned earlier how he was always lightning the cannon cart before the RG locked on. Yes. Even if he got one more RG hit that game, he would have won. And then even when he, uh, let's say the RG was locked on, great work with the log and the Ice Spirit to reset the RG on the cannon cart when necessary. The interactions at the end were absolutely phenomenal from Keith. And then you talk again about that Hog Rider sneaking in at the end. He knew that Sandbox had to sell out. But here we go. Game number two. Can Keith 2 0 this, or will Sandbox bounce back? Both Rock and that Ice Wizard on the battle banner. I think I'm going to hop on that train as well. Maybe it'll make me play better. It's my favorite battle banner, especially yeah. as a splasher player. I like it. Okay, okay, okay. So, nice moment here for us to all take a breath, and then we see Keith come out with his favorite win condition of the tournament. 70, per wow. 80, excuse me, 83% win rate for Keith, and then a beautiful Magic Archer lineup early on. Maybe a little over-aggressive, we'll find out. That was one of the most aggressive starting plays I've ever seen, but it looks like it's gonna work out, because he has the Giant Skelly, even after that 5% HP nerf, is still doing such a great job of blocking up this entire lane right now. AQ gets that second shot in, which I think the best thing that Sandbox could have hoped for, however, you go back to that Magic Archer Plus drill, 2039 to 2602. And a great start for Keith again. I really like Keith's choice of deck here. Looks like it's going to be that bridge spam Magic Archer drill deck. That's one we've seen a lot. And I think the biggest reason why I like it is there's multiple ways to get damage. You have the Magic Archer Tornado and you have the drill as your win condition. So Giant Skeleton out in both directions here. No surprise as, like you said, Juice, even it got that 5% nerf, still incredibly, incredibly strong. Dark Prince in the back to help clean up those goblins. And a healthy counter push going down both lanes. I'm wondering how he can defend this. He really needs a giant skelly of his own. He does place it, but look at the look Goblin at Brawler on the right Brawler. side. Brawler on the tower, Mega Minion untouched. That should be a tower down unless something crazy happens. Nato does come back, but only 4.08 remaining, and this is already looking great for the South Korean. 
that's just one of those mistakes you can't be making at an event like this. He needs to place that giant skeleton one more tile to the right to ensure that that goblin brawler is getting pulled in. Yeah, that was really it. I mean, even then, if the Mega Minion somehow ignores, you got to get that Brawler 100%. Beautiful start there for Sandbox, or I should say, a fire back to a strong start from Keefe. Cycle Snowball goes to the right, Golden Knight to the left, 1774 to 350. At this point in the game, I really don't see Keefe winning this unless Sandbox chokes. He does have the poison for the Magic Archer. The Golden Knight can be picked up very easily by that cage, and... You know, you have the Dark Prince for the drill as well. It's, yeah. it's a hard counter. Absolutely, and especially with a big miss like that early on, it makes it very, very difficult to play through a bad matchup and some misplays. Drill plus Bark Barrel here, but the Dark Prince is picking this up. He goes for the Geometry onto the Magic Archer, but is not able to get it down. And Sandbox with the Prediction Snowball on this Magic Archer as well, preventing the lineup with the Tornado. That was a beautiful play. And Keith ran a deck similar to this through the qualifiers, although he did not have Giant Skeleton in it. And that was a 100% win, uh, win rate deck. He ran it nine times, won with it nine times, but decided to change it up just a little bit here. He takes out the Royal Ghost, adds in the Giant Skeleton, and maybe just Making that cycle that much more expensive made it a very difficult defense. We both saw that it was going to be over-aggressive, and I think this is going to be an easy game to win for Sandbox. Jackson, talk to me a little bit about that beginning. I mean, like I said, you need to be placing that giant skeleton one more tile to the right. That Golden Brawler, you know, it doesn't seem like it, but he hits hard. Yeah. He, has a, he does a yeah, lot of damage. Really and, you know, now you have to be thinking about the mindset once again. You really don't want to be a key in a situation like this. Sandbox has that momentum now, and he's looking to reverse sweep. We've got a best of one for $10,000 guaranteed coming up in just a moment. But Juicy, in the very, very opening moments of that game, we both kind of went, ooh, that's really, really aggressive. Why do you think he thought that was the right way to go? And do you think it was the reason why he didn't have enough elixir to defend? Because he was at 10 when he started to defend, but he was defending against like 15. I honestly don't think it was too aggressive. It ended up working out the start for him really well. I just think maybe he was a little bit too aggressive on the second push. Yeah. Because he really needed to sit back for a second and maybe react. And that's one of those decks where that's what you want to do. You want to go for the defense and counter push. One to one to start our day, which is exactly what you want at World Finals. The first best of three going to game number three, which is going to be starting right now. And I like how close they are on the podium. They're looking at each other. I know! That's what we love about being in person. It's so intense. So here we go. Just a stop and stare. Sandbox would come out with a hog early on. And an MK, not usually what you want to see. Hog does get one shot here. I really am wondering what Sandbox is using. OK, Mighty Miner. You might be seeing a copy here with the Mighty Miner and Roll, roll Delivery plus Cannon Cards Mortar deck here. So delivery comes down. AQ, though, not taken off the board yet. She should get a shot in. Sandbox decides to get some skellies down to protect. And we find ourselves even in Elixir. Sandbox up by about 300 HP. Keith most likely using a Ram Rider Bridge Shram deck here with Lightning. And Zappy's interesting. Honestly, I would say that... Oh, and Flying Machine. I would say that Keith has a decent matchup here with the Flying Machine because it could be difficult to deal with. You do have the roll delivery, but unless Fire Spirit's your last card, it can be difficult to take those out. Mortar should get one more shot. There it goes. That's a great shot for Sandbox as the Mighty Miter comes down in the opposite lane. Queen working down the right side. Champion for Sandbox on the left. Hog Rider sneaks in front. This is an interesting play here. Yeah, Fisherman's going to get a lot of value here. It gets the King Tire Activation, and it's going to get a very nice trade. But the Mighty Miner heats up and does so much damage. I was going to say, he had almost no Elixir to deal with, and I think if he spent more, he'd be in even more trouble right now. You see that they're basically even with the Fisherman on the board, and now we see the Piggies come down. Three to the left, one to the right with the Fisherman in tow. you got to be feeling good if you're Sandbox right now. You can see it as well. He's nodding his head. He hasn't taken a lick of damage yet, and he still has a very... Decently housed mortar here, gonna kind of stall the lane here. If Keith wants to win this game, he definitely needs a huge push to break through the Mighty Miner plus mortar defense. You see Sandbox there taking a deep breath. I saw him speaking with someone before the match about those nerves and how to calm them. And a big thing about it was taking those big, deep breaths, center yourself. You know this game, you love the, this game, you're the best in the world at this game. And you can see him taking those breaths and playing very, very well right now. 1294 to two healthy towers. 
I really like what he's doing with the split lane pressure. This queen's gonna get a lot of value just killing this entire mortar. Now the pigs are gonna come down. Roll delivery and mortar out of cycle here. Snowball on the skeletons. Roll delivery does get cycled back to. Oh yeah. And that's gonna be enough. Sandbox knows that was more than enough. He gets a little bit of applaud from the audience there. That was some great stuff from the top of the screen. Fisherman getting some solid value here, pulling in things from both sides, also kind of preventing a hog rider for, from being placed on the map. And Keith, once again, setting up with another Mega Knight in the back. He needs that big push. Sandbox, a 74% win rate when running Hog Rider. Keith on the other side of it, 86% in the seven games that he played, although not having that success right now. I'm really interested to see what Keith's last card is. He needs some sort of big spell to deal with these Musketeers. Look how much value they're getting from Sandbox's side. Taking out the Mega Knight, taking out the Flying Machine, and now counter pushing with this Mortar on the left. Musky and AQ serving the same purpose a lot. Some people like the three card cycle and the power of the champion. Other people like the fact that you can stack multiple Musketeers on the board. That's what's happening right here. Musketeer is going to get snowballed, but that's definitely not enough. Mighty Miners can protect that. A little celebration from Sandbox. He's loving the situation right now. And keep going for a bit of a desperation piggies into this Musketeer. Fine, she couldn't take it out, though. Yeah, well, you know, you saw Sandbox there kind of overspend with that delivery. He didn't really need it, so that's why the Hogs come down immediately. But still, Sandbox is going to lock this defense down. Flying Machine is still living in no man's land, but nothing to worry about. Another delivery back down. This deck cycles like crazy. And we saw the value of the Flying Machine once again there. Took out two Musketeers. Sandbox, slight mistake there, failing to protect his Musketeer with the Skeletons. So Hog Rider working down that right-hand side, not going to do a whole lot as a Mega Knight and a Mighty Miter do things out in the left lane. AQs have been incredibly well controlled this entire game, Juicy. Absolutely. This Flying Machine in the middle of the map is probably, once again, the most scary thing for Sandbox. It's sitting here, taking out the roll delivery, taking out the mortars. He needs a connection, though. Sandbox is holding on quite well, but with 30 seconds left, I can see a big push really taking a tower here potentially if Sandbox just makes one mistake. And for everyone rooting for Sandbox, we hope that that not, is not the case. But as you said, that's really Keefe's only opportunity at this point. And there you go. Musketeer plus delivery going to snipe out that flying machine. Sandbox is nodding his head. He knows that he's got this unlocked with only 10 seconds left. And this is huge when you talk about what this means on day number one. You never want to have your back up against the wall. You never want to be eliminated on day number one. $30,000 is great, $20,000 is great, but we're all about that $250,000 sandbox takes our first match of the day. Keith sets down his headphones and he knows he's got some work to do. Yep, loser's bracket will be grueling. He's not out yet. He still has a chance, but it's going to be a lot more difficult. I mean, we saw the Hog Rider Mighty Miner deck come through twice, and both times they were able to win. I think it's a really, really solid deck, like we talked about, especially when we're not going up against air. And the reason is there's just so many solid defensive options. You have the cannon cart, the Mighty Miner is a tank killer, and a swarm controller, as well as the mortar on defense. It's just so tanky. Juice, talk to me about the matchup here in uh, game number three. I think the biggest thing is the protection of your glass cannon. Whoever's going to get more value from their fly machine or the musketeer mm. is going to be in a really solid situation. But like I just said, he's got the mortar, he's got a nice damage dealer musketeer, and he's got the mighty miner. And the delivery to boot, it's so hard to break through something like that. I'm going to steal that from you. Glass cannon, fly machine, and musketeer. Love that. I want you to take over for a minute because Sweep is a big friend of, or a good friend of yours. You're a big fan of him. Uh, Arden is my dark horse pick. Sweep is someone who you really want to win. Although I do think Sweep has a little bit more live stage experience. Any thoughts? Sweep is my dark horse pick. The reason I did it is what he said at the very end of that interview. His best strategy to win world finals, be unpredictable, and that is Sweep in a couple words. He's very unpredictable with his own deck picks, but he's also taking advantage of his opponent's predictability. He wants to hit those snipes, and if he can do that, he's gonna have a very nice run, I think. Match number two, game number one. Let's go. My badges are pathetic compared to theirs. But it's nice to see some good ones. Arden at the top of your screen. Sweep at the bottom. Sweep had an incredible run in our August qualifiers, going 80% overall in his matches. And of course, Arden Toas getting that fifth golden ticket. Able to sit back, sit pretty, and know he was going to show up in Helsinki. Looks like Sweep is going to be using Roll of Giants here. It is his third most used deck. He has a 78% win rate with it. So kind of surprising to see a little bit more predictability. Maybe it's reverse psychology. 
Maybe he wants to be predictable to be unpredictable. <laughs> hey, I mean, look, when you're that guy that's that unpredictable, I actually love what you're saying, Juicy. That makes a lot of sense. And I think the other thing about Sweep's unpredictability in his decks is his decks are still great, right? They're still very good. They're not off meta trash, but that Fisherman pulling that RG to the tower, that is not a good start for Ardentoas. He stops the bleeding pretty quickly as this AQ powers up. That Royal Ghost working down the lane, 24-38 to 28-45. Royal Hogs come down. I have to say that was very aggressive from Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, he's gonna see uh, you know, the consequences of his actions. He's gonna be taking quite a bit of damage. Fishman does a decent job of taking out the pigs and getting that King Tower activation though. Perfect placement there on the Archer Queen from Arden. He's probably gonna pop the ability once he's pulled in. There it is. Yeah, I really like that idea. A lot of people would place that Archer Queen sooner to prevent the pull, but since the Fisherman was so close to the tower there, if, unless Sweep was like really quick on his feet, which he was, he might have gotten some Archer Queen shots in tower. Sweep laughing maybe a little bit at the arrow spend. It was not really worthwhile, if you will. He was just a little bit behind, but he got more damage on tower. Maybe Sweep not thinking it's the best idea, but still only down by a couple hundred HP. Very, very even, if you will, as we go into overtime. Arden Toas up. Kind of a giant scale on giant scale mirror match here. I think the other most important thing is the Archer Queens, though. Most likely Sweep's last card. I mean, it's, it's either Lightning or Earthquake, right? If it's not Lightning, Sweep's going to be having a really tough time because Arden does have the Fireball Arrows combo for the Archer Queen, and he doesn't. AQ at the bridge. RG to defend. AQ pops the ability. Fireball comes in. Not a lot of action happening on the left side. AQ does get on the tower. Now we have the weaker tower on the left-hand side. 1783 to 2031. Royal Ghost, nice use of the E-Spirit there to make sure that Royal Ghost does not become a bigger threat and a fish boy to block the other one. Wow, that was really smart gameplay. I did not expect a fireball from Sweep, but this is actually very useful against Arden's win condition, the Royal Hogs. So he is down damage right now. If he can build up big pushes and maybe have some dual lane pressure, I think he could win this game if he's playing well. Giant Skeleton working down that right-hand lane. Gets pulled to the center here with that sight range, but that Zappy does get on the right tower. Not really the biggest deal, but there's the Log coming down. Log only hitting two of the pigs. Hunter gonna come down as well. Fireball to defend the AQ. The dual lane pressure is relentless. AQ on the tower, Hogs ah. on the tower. Sweep is taking a beating right now. And Arden does have quite a bit of direct damage, so it can be, it's gonna be very difficult to prevent him from taking this left-hand side. He goes for the RG in the back. He's saying, it's my turn. I'm going to try and stack up a push, but I'm not sure if it's going to be enough. Let's see if wow. these pigs connect. Sell out push on the left-hand side. That giant skeleton is not going to be enough damage. AQ is going to be too little. Arrows are going to come down. 61 HP remains, and the fireball is in. A clean game number one from Arden Toas. Very, very nice game from him. He played very well. He punished the overaggression at the start and then continued with split lane pressure and it just didn't seem like Sweep could find an opportunity to defend perfectly. Let's take a look here at the replay, Juicy. I'm going to let you break this down because you know so much about the game and I know some about the game. Okay, Rogue Hogs coming to the right-hand side. He places the Hunter right out of range there, but the Fireball comes in and takes that out. But this Queen ability, that's wow. the biggest thing here. It does so much damage. I think Sweep thought that the Fireball would do a good job of countering that Arch Queen, but the Barbarian, oh no, the Fisherman, I believe, on the left-hand side was tanking for that Queen and it just wasn't an interaction that he was familiar with. All right, here we go. Game number two coming your way. Sweep looking to even things up to 1-1. One, one. Let's go. Arden Toas in May was able to get sixth place on ladder. And of course, in March, he got third place in a global tournament. So had a lot of success in our in-game formats. And it looks like Mighty Miner out in both directions. And there was whispers on Twitter yesterday of a Mighty Miner nerf coming in. So getting the best that you can out of him while you still can. Yeah, right now it's definitely a top two champion right alongside that Archer Queen. I'm looking at Sweep's deck right now and I don't even want to guess what it is. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you can fall on that sword, <laughs> brother. I'm going to sit back and, <laughs> and let you do that. So right now Sweep has got E-Wiz, Bandit, Mighty Miner, Barbarrel, Poison, top of your screen. I think all of us know what this is. The only change is that we started to see Spear Goblins pop in a bit more as of late. And of course, Spear Goblins also getting a little bit of love with that Goblin Gang change. Yep, Spear Goblin's just able to apply a little bit more pressure, and I lied. I am going to take a crack at this deck. I think it is a Mega Knight Ram Rider deck. There's the Ram Rider in the back here. Mother Witch here as well. Overall, with the matchup, I think it's solid for Sweep, 
It is in Arden's kind of court here, though, because if Arden is able to defend perfectly throughout the match, Sweep's not going to be able to break through. But all it takes is one mistake from Arden in order to secure a victory for Sweep. So how does Sweet play this correctly, Juicy? Is it all about being super patient until he's got a little bit more elixir to play with since this deck is a bit heavier? Yeah, you have to play very passive. You have to defend as best as you can in the single elixir. Once you get to double elixir, that's going to be your time. And I think the biggest thing is to remember to defend the Goblin Barrels with the Mega Knight. You don't want to be barbarling it every time because you want to save the barbarrel for the second Goblin that will come while you're pressuring. And you also want to defend with the Mega Knight so you can create huge counter pushes to try and break through. That Goblin... Dark Goblin just got about 10, 12 Elixir worth of value. And you count in that tower damage on top of the cleanup there. Beautiful stuff. Nice use of the Ice Spirit to get on top of the E-Wiz and the Mighty Miner. Does miss one of the Goblins. Does get a stab in. 1692 to 2828. Now, with 48 seconds remaining in regulation, Sweep feeling like he needs to turn up the heat. He goes Ram Rider in the back on the right-hand side and a full send on the left. Yeah, you have to go for a split lane pressure in a matchup like this because your opponent is using a rocket. Goblin Barrel's gonna come in. This is what I was talking about. Use the yeah. bar barrel on defense for the oh, first wow. Goblin Barrel. And the Mother Witch is gonna do a decent job um, in spawn some pigs, though. Yeah, Mother Witch doing actually a pretty dang good job of cleaning all that up. 1634 now remains on that tower. Sweep decides to double down in this left hand lane. That Dark Goblin does get protected, or at least Ooh. the Mega Knight jumps the other way, but it's on top of the cannon. Look and at now that Mother Sweet Witch! Has it on the tower. Mother Witch getting the piggies in. Ram Rider behind, Bandit behind. We're going to game number three. Wow. You were focused on the Mega Knight, and that was very important, that connection on the tower, but I was so focused on that Mother Witch at the end there. Arden misclicked a Ice Spirit. She did not get frozen up, and that allowed her to turn the Ice Spirit into a pig and then take out that Dark Goblin. If he wow. could have kept his Dark Goblin alive, he might have been able to defend that. Yeah, when you are going against a quick cycle deck like this that does not have a Fireball or a Poison Mother Witch is definitely the key here. She's spawning right here. Spawns wow. a pig on the Ice Spirit, misclicked from Arden, and, and then, then it gets on the Dark it Goblin. It gets the, dark the second out. shot in time. If that Ice Spirit did connect on the Mother Witch, the Log would have been able to come down in time, and maybe Arden would have been able to hold on and defend. But because of that Mother Witch value, the Mega Knight and everything just started swarming towards the tower. Now we're going to game three. It's a best of one, and this is where I think the scales start to tip back in favor of Sweet because of experience. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. We saw in the first match, when you get into this reverse sweep situation, you have the confidence behind you. And now, because of the new duels formatting, Sweep, he's able to take that sniping, that, that unpredictability to the next level. He's able to edit his decks right now and make changes based on the decks that Arden has played. There, let's go to game number three and see if Sweep keeps us guessing. Snowball from Arden. Mm, could be a lot of things. We do see the snowball a lot in a third game set because you don't have the log and stuff like that. Uh, we talked about the versatility of snowball quite a bit. Miner comes in after that, and Sweep's going to pick that up with a mini P.E.K.K.A. I see Sweep use mini P.E.K.K.A. a lot, actually. I think he likes that card. I mean, it's an incredible card, not one of the most popular in the game, but we have started to see it just a little bit more and more. Maybe it's because of how popular Cannon Cart did get for a while. It's a great way to counter it. And of course, getting on top of the E-Giants. Wow. Speaking of E-Giants, there's an E-Giant with a mini P.E.K.K.A. in tow in terms of cards. Yep, Arden does have the Mortar. He does have the Cannon Cart for the E-Giant. Those are a couple solid counters. E-Giant is doing its best to take out this Mortar, but it's locked on right now. Now here comes a Dark Prince. Arden has a quite a, a lot of elixir. He is going to go for a Valkyrie here, but the Infernal Dragon is at full health right now. Snowball to push it back off. No, he decides to just eat it there and then maybe drops. There's the Snowball late. Gets on top of the Mini Peck as well. Nice decision making there. But look how low Arden is on elixir yeah. right now, and it doesn't seem like he has any Mini Peck gets cards. a shot. Mini Peck gets another shot. It will get a three. three. And a Musketeer comes down late, and that is the last thing you want. Now Sweep can defend this very easily. Arden down six, and a Musketeer on the board. Sweep decides to eat one shot, and they get Zappies in play. Wow, that is the perfect start that you're looking for if you are Sweep at this point. We're 20 seconds away from double elixir. Arden needs a massive mortar connection to come back right now. He needed to get that miner off to the inside a little bit to distract the Inferno and pull the mini P.E.K.K.A. in. When you go miner right on top of mini P.E.K.K.A., that is not going to do what you want. And while uh, mortar plus miner Valk Muskie does usually pretty well against E-Giant, Arden is really struggling. And that's a great point that you made there. A little bit of a better minor placement maybe would have allowed him to have a more time. He is going to get one more connection right here. But Sweep having the Earthquake right now and one wow. more E-Giant hit. He just needs like 
two more earthquakes and maybe a tornado to you finish off this game. See the difference in body language there. Arden kind of grimacing while Sweep nodding his head just to tell you the whole story of what is going on right now in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, Sweep just has to have good defense, and he does have it. He has the cannon. That's one of the best defensive cards in the game. That's a great NATO, too. Yep, the NATO with the E Giant's gonna always make sure that the cannon car and the Musketeer are not getting the value it needs. And 50 HP on the right hand side, that's just one tornado away. So, 16 seconds away from a sandbox sweep matchup down the line. But most importantly, Arden and Keith fighting for their lives. Wow. I, I you know, I was kind of worried for sweep at the end there, or at that, after that first game, but. Good game, really nice reverse sweep. What went wrong in game number one with this matchup? Once again, it is a Giants Clay Mirror matchup. I think the biggest thing, I talked about it a bit during the match, sweep has no way to fully kill an Arch Queen. Does have a Fireball, E-Spirit, Log combo, but you know Arden has that Fireball, Arrows combo. Let's go to the next deck. So in this point, we're in deck two, looking at a Mega Knight, Mirror matchup, or sorry, not a Mega Knight Mirror matchup, but Mega Knight versus Bait. And I think the most important thing about this matchup is that Mother Witch. Arden yeah. only has the rocket. He needs to cycle two logs to kill one of those Mother Witches. And we saw that was the turning point in the match. And here we go to deck number three. Sweep decides to run E Giant, which again, you talk about predictability. Nowhere on his stats do I see E Giant in August, but brilliant plays with it. Let's take a look at the replay, and I have a feeling I might know what part it is. RF, don't do me wrong. Here it is. Yeah, it's that crazy pressure, right? He went in with single elixir, a big E Giant push and he plays his mini pack, he never stopped relenting on the pressure. Like you said, Arden, with an unoptimal minor placement, should have tried to kite that mini pack further to the middle. You can see the celebration from Sweep right here after those three huge mini pack shots that basically secured him the game. Let's waste no time. Let's jump right into it. KK and Mohammed Light. And here we go. KK spent plenty of time playing in live events during his CRL team's career. Mohammed Light, everyone talks about him like he is, like, I mean, like he's already a legend with the level of gameplay. The big question is, what is he feeling right now on stage? I mean, he goes for the ice spear, he goes for the minor. He's feeling all right right now. He's leaking elixir. He's waiting for his opponent to make a play. I respect that. Pigs are coming down. How's he going to feel? Guard to the right hand side, cannon to the left. Going to eat a little bit of damage here early on. Minor wall breakers, the original one trick deck for Mohammed Light. Yep, very good. I'm um, not sure if he's using wall breakers this time. Maybe more of a control variation, a variation with these guards. Very, very optimal card to have for defense. And the piggies plus the EQ here for KK. We'll see if he's running Archer Queen, and yes, he is. Archer Queen versus Archer Queen. I want to say on this bottom, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what it is. He has a giant skeleton. I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe just control in general or maybe a balloon come out from Mo here. And that's a nice bomb deep in there, but the AQ for Mo's not going to quite connect. Even without that, though, the scores here pretty close to each other. 2758 on Mo's bottom right hand tower, 2762 on the top left hand side. Yeah, I think this is a close matchup here. I think the Miner is generally going to be a little bit more consistent in damage, but all it takes is one huge Pigs connection for KK to really turn it to his favor. Giant Skeleton left-hand lane, both these players playing Cannon. Of course, Cannon has been such a central part of the meta for a while, and we'll see with some of the, the work in progress deck balances if that maybe changed next time around. And the high cannon does get hit by the EQ. That's going to be a lot of piggies on through to the right-hand side. Yep, roll delivery is going to come down late. But once again, those pigs are making it to the tower, and they do a lot of damage. Queen ability coming out a little bit late from KK on the left. Moe's going to use his own, but roll delivery cleaned out quite nicely. And KK is on point with these minor catches. Yeah, that's a nice cannon pickup. And now the pressure back in again. This time, Moe going a little bit farther out. With that cannon picking up most of those picks, one connects, but the lead's starting to open up for KK here as we are just 18 seconds away from sudden death. 
Yeah, Mo's just not playing as optimally as we normally see it. He went for the anti-earthquake cannon there. He tried to push that one pig over to the Ice Spirit, but just a little bit too late. And as the Queen goes to her ability, Miner does turn for a little bit of damage here. Poison will help out as well. Log Force will be played against that Queen, so right now Mo does have about a one Elixir lead, but is behind on damage. He goes for the early cannon here, predicting the pigs. He gets it. He goes for the Ice Spirit. That's going to push it over. But a quick cannon from KK is going to allow the defensive cannon to get taken out quite nicely. And there's that pig connecting a little bit once again. Here comes the counter push, though. Even an elixir, but way more on the board with that Archer Queen. This feels like it's Mohammed Light's big moment. Can he get a good breakthrough here? Queen working up high against the push. The minor plus poison doing some pretty significant damage. And it is Mohammed Light who now roars back into this game, but the pigs push on the right hand side. Cannon and roll delivery on defense. Earthquake coming down a little bit late, and those pigs are gone. Now, at this point, Muhammad Light is a, in a pretty good situation. All he needs to do is have good defense, utilize his Queen three card cycle to get multiple poisons and miners down on the board as we head into Triple X. Pigs to the right hand side. Slow down a little bit. Will delivery get there? It's a cannon to pick up. Log gets the cannon off the board. Guards plus delivery mitigates most of that, but damage done. Down under 900 HP right now is the right hand side for Mohammed Light. And now Poison just ticks a bit on that Archer Queen, but more importantly, working on that left hand tower. What I really think is the big mistake here is the Queen on the left side. I think you want to play on the right side, block up this lane, get your three card cycle rolling, and play as many miners and poisons as possible. Minor poison down. 708 is the mark he has to surpass right now. Archer Queen taken care of. Most of the pigs do go over to that cannon and then picked up. 546 on the right hand side. EQ doing its job. Final 18 seconds. Poison drops here. Those ice spirits are always catching those miners. Miner does get one shot. Pre cannon once again. Are we going to see the push over? We do. Earthquake and log coming down. Eight seconds left. Miner in. Pre skeletons catch the miner. Miner goes bye bye. EQ gets it done. KK takes game number one. Wow, I did not expect that. I think that Mo could have made a lot of more optimal plays there. And like I said, I think the biggest mistake was not playing the Arch Queen on defense. Use the Arch Queen on defense, get the three card cycle rolling, and play the poisons before the miner. A lot of the time in a minor poison matchup like this, you want to play the poison first, miner second, and cycle back to that poison super fast. Guards down on the defense here. Log trying to get some chip on the left here. Once again, very nice pickup on the miner with the Ice Spirit. Miner gets one shot. And notice he plays the poison after. If you can cycle the poison first and get back to it a little bit quicker, that can make a huge difference. And at this point, once again, skeletons coming down, ice spirit coming down, miner is not connecting, and the earthquake is going to secure the victory. I think a lot of the time, Mo was using his cycle cards before he played his miner or poison. And when you're doing that, you're not able to cycle back quick enough. But also, it is because of KK applying pressure at the right times. Mo was constantly forced to use one of his cycle cards on defense for the pigs to push it over to his cannon. Yes, yeah, I don't know if we can take a look at the, the decks from game number one, if we do have those available, but you know, you talk about the building for game number two and beyond. Spells such a critical factor. Log out the most important one, maybe, on the side of KK. So we'll go ahead and see if they that does end up factor here in game number two as we jump on it. With Archer Queen out on both sides, how much does that nerf lightning as far as your deck building goes from here? Honestly, quite a bit. There's really not a good use for Lightning when the Arch Queen is out. Obviously, you can pick up maybe a Musketeer or something like this, but Mo with the Tombstone, this is definitely not something you want to use Lightning against, but we might actually see it from KK. Potentially a Royal Giant deck, yes. And the Mother Witch out behind this Skeleton King. Interesting combination where you kind of have a dual synergy as she takes them off the board and creates offensive pressure. She also feeds that Skeleton King. Absolutely. So it looks like we might be actually seeing a RG mirror match right now. RG in the back from Mo. RG at the bridge from KK, though. Very aggressive Barbell to take out the Hunter, but bats are all over that. Zappy's trying to help, but they're totally distracted. And that Royal Giant is going to get a ton of value on the right-hand side. It's still not being targeted by the Zappies quite yet. It gets one final shot before retargeting to that Tombstone. Now there's a kind of push from Mo. What does KK have for this? He gets the Fish Wind down. He gets the East Spirit to connect on absolutely everything. So much value there. Archie actually switches targeting, which is so good for him. And once again, the Fish Wind is going to get even more value pulling that Skelly King. 
that fisherman is doing so much right now for KK. And you know, you talk about making picks as games go on. KK going RG Fireball rather than RG Lightning, which is what he usually does. And you have the Zappies and the Mother Witch, lots of great targets for that Fireball. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just so amazed by the fisherman value there. It didn't stop at the Skelly King, it ended up pulling in the Mother Witch and the Barbarian from the Barbarrel as well. It was so fascinating. Really good plays from KK here. You know, a lot of fishermen have to lie about the size of the fish they pull down, not KK now. Got a good story for him. <laughs> as we go into double elixir time, it's KK ahead by quite a lot, 1939 to 1210 on the right-hand side. Juicy, what does Mo have to do to stay in this one? To stay in this, you gotta cycle a lot of tombstones. KK does have the fireball for your main counter to the RG, the Zappies. So if you're always cycling tombstones, you can bait the fireballs as well as just get a lot of value with distraction and DPS from those skeletons. And this time a nice fisherman play out of Mohammed who holds on and KK leaking a little bit there, trying to make a decision, get the optimal timing as that Royal Ghost does go in front of the Zappies and distract for the RG, but a nice fisherman tombstone play here for Mo. Fisher and Tombstone play, and the RG oh. still is able to get somehow, even with the Skelly King here. Skelly King does have a very nicely charged ability here. Two Fishermen's on the board. Are we going to see counter push right now? There it is. Royal Giant behind. Skelly King does pop the ability. That's very big right now for Mohammed Light. Fireball does not hit much, but the RG hits a whole lot of tower, and suddenly Mohammed Light right back in the lead. But can he defend this push? Now he has to defend. He's got the Tombstone. He's got the Fisherman. Fireball's gonna come in very nicely here, and Archie's locked on the tower, and it's healthy. Oh my word, the unthinkable has happened. Mohammed Light loses in round number one. And a sigh of relief and a bit of a celebration from KK. That is a huge win, an upset, in fact. I've beaten the best player in the world. I will win the championship. Confidence is so important. Let's head over to the deck breakdown. Deck one, we saw a giant skelly roll delivery. I thought this deck was very weird. A lot of the time you're gonna be seeing a log plus poison or maybe a giant skeleton plus log. Like having giant skeleton roll delivery is weird. It does the same sort of thing. Getting a little bit fancy here in game number one. KK taking that one on to our second game. Royal Giants both directions, but you gotta feel like the Fireball being in KK's deck and two of the most important pieces, Mother Witch for the Bats and the Zappies, of course, for the Royal Giant, made that a difficult situation for Mo. Absolutely. I think the biggest thing there was the Hunter provides so much value in DPS on the defense and the Fireball doesn't take it out. And then simply on the other end of the spectrum, the Fireball kills the Zappies and that's the main crutch of the defense in that deck. Much has been made about how on paper these two players are very similar, both 8.7K for that personal best on ladder. Both have been around for a long time, very versatile players overall. But the question here, Juicy, is what separates Air Surfer from Pandora? I think the biggest thing that separates them is a lot of the time Air Surfer is going to be using cards based upon making a push or a straightforward attack like the RG and the Hog, whereas Pandora is using stuff, win conditions that are more placed on the tower, like the Miner and the Drill. And when you get in matchups like that, a lot of the time, if the player that is using the more consistent on the tower win condition, if they defend well, they are going to win. Well, we'll find out if that turns out to be true. Let's jump down for game number one of Air Surfer and Pandora. Air Surfer, top of your screen, Pandora at the bottom, and you see Pandora going right to Miner, directly on tower. Absolutely, Air Surfer with the bar build a counter in a cage. So that makes me think more like RG, like I predicted, or potentially maybe even more of a beatdown oriented thing like a Golem or an Electro Giant. Musky high and gonna take care of the Goblin Brawler, but not quite that baby dragon. So gonna have to put something out there to control. Giant, or the Skelly King does pull to the opposite lane and Air Surfer now with Night Witch. Night Witch, that's definitely going to be a Golem. Pandora has the poison for the Night Witch, though. It's a very important card. Tornado's gonna kill this Bats and pull that Skelly King back. Night Witch is gonna fall, but overall, Pandora's got a very nice damage lead here on the left. Up one Elixir, though, is Air Surfer. And the big question is, if you throw a pile of rocks down here and single Elixir, opts not to and goes for the Bar Barrel and Skarmy right behind that with a minor counterplay. 
I really like that play to play passive and not go for that golem on the back in the single. Pandora has a lot of baby cards that can apply a lot of pressure for cheap in the single elixir and very, very good defense as well along with, with Mus Musketeer and a very solid building in the mortar. And a great read there from Pandora as a nice lightning comes in courtesy of Air Surfer for a little extra damage plus baby dragon. Mortar does not pick up an quickly enough. Pandora recognizing NATO out of cycle put that miner in the back. Let's see how that interaction goes as the game goes on. Pandora just barely able to get enough elixir for that scar meat. Barbro does come off, but that mortar always getting that final shot off. And Pandora's just is extending that damage laid further and further as this game goes on. But we are heading close into double elixir soon. Yeah, what is the gap that Pandora wants to create before, and for not, not just the towers down. What's the gap he wants to create before we get into double and triple? Uh, I mean, you're looking at maybe at least a thousand damage lead here because a lot of the time, once it hits into that later elixir time, you're going to be constantly defending. You'll be able to send a miner here or there, but a lot of the time, especially when you're in a same lane situation, that is just going to feed into the counter push for air server. So Golem down way in the back, a pressure Skarmy on the right hand side. Bar Barrel takes care of it, but of course feeds that Skeleton King who pops the ability. And the Golden Knight going to go take care of the Miner as the Skeleton King's spawned troops just shred that goal. Really nice dash here, taking out the Musketeer. Pandora is back to a second one. Lightning is in cycle. I wouldn't be surprised to see a Lightning come down right here. Does get the Musky off the board and a nice, beautiful Miner play with the Baby Dragon. And Air Surfer takes control just as we go into sudden death. Pandora with no air targeting cards in cycle was forced to just go scar meat. Skeleton King, more to the bridge. He needs to try and get his damage back. Ability is going to pop. Musketeer taking out this baby dragon. Gold Knight down to control and distract this mortar. There's no damage coming through for Pandora right now. And some bats to protect there. So Air Surfer has to let those ones go down. A nice miner to pull that Night Witch back, plus some poison damage. But no mortar shot. Skelly King on the defense to distract the baby dragon. This is a very, very close match. But 30 seconds until Triple Elixir. Pandora needs to get a very solid amount of damage before that Triple Elixir comes in, or else the Golem will be constantly applying pressure. Miner picked up pretty easily here by that Golden Knight, and Skeletons won't do much at all with the baby dragon and, of course, the Brawler. But a mortar connection that's very important right now for Pandora. Mortar connection, absolutely very important. Lightning's gonna come down here. Mortar just barely able to prevent this Golden Knight dash. Very close game. Will the Mortar get the shot? Wow. It does. Wow, it just barely gets off. Here we are, Triple Elixir, 763 to 589. Pandora holding on. And as we near closer and closer to the end of this match, we have to be thinking about the direct damage. Lightning is just very, very close, and Golden Knight not able to make it. Huge push on the left, though. Lightning in, will that be enough? Skarmy trying to save, Baby Dragon on tower. Baby Dragon on tower, but it turns. 68 HP, one final belch. Air Surfer takes game number one. He does indeed, able to apply that pressure as we got into Triple Elixir, like I said. He didn't even have to go for a Golem. He stacked baby dragons, lightened those Musketeers, realizing that there's just not much in Pandora's deck to deal with that baby dragon tornado combo. With Golem out and with Miner out, I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe some Hog Rider from Air Surfer. And Pandora likes Goblin Barrel a lot. Maybe we'll see some Goblin Barrel. We do have at least one more game to go for this matchup, so let's jump right into it. Game number two. And that's the patented Air Surfer emote, the Celebration Pig. Already a mistake here. Tombstone not able to pull the Fire Spear. Pandora gonna, Pandora gonna capitalize on that as well and take that Earthquake damage. Skelly drags the back. Maybe a Lava Hound push from Air Surfer here. You know, we talk about the idea of innovation and Air Surfer well known for cycle decks, certainly known to, to mix things up a bit. So if this is Lava Hound, very, very interesting choice. I like his idea here just to leak Elixir. He doesn't want to go for Lava in the back and succumb to a Hog Rider. And he's just waiting for Pandora to make a play that he can react upon. There's the Hog Rider. Here we go. There you go. And talk, as we were talking about before, Pandora kind of goes by the numbers. NATO out, Hog Rider, the logical play here. The question is, what does Air Surfer have prepared for this matchup? It's a tough one. Generally, if the Hog Rider player can apply a lot of pressure and defend really well and rely on your Archer Queen for defense, it can go okay. But 
once again, when we're talking about champions, Archfiend only able to take out, or only be play, able to place once at a time, but he has, the, he has the Inferno Tower, Rich. Wow, that's a huge, huge choice here. And knowing that with this deck, the, the biggest danger is probably that Lava Hound, and the Inferno Tower changes the math here significantly. Oh, by so much. I was so surprised to see that Inferno Tower. Now, at this point, I definitely see the matchup really shifting in Pandora's favor. He has a massive damage lead, damage lead in the single elixir. He's continuing that lead with Fire Spirit Chip, with the Hog Rider coming in. Air Surfer's gonna have a really, really hard time breaking through, the, through those Inferno Tower plus Arch Queen defenses. Yeah, I mean, and there's also so, no phenomenal response to those Hogs as well, because we put the Tombstone down, EQ, goodbye, tower down. Yeah, and the Mighty Miner, you know, does a decent job, but it's only able to stop the Hog to one hit. A lot of the time we see the Mighty Miner paired with a Log in order to defend something like that, but obviously Air Server using a Zap here in the Lava Hound deck. And so this is the big question. Can this big push find a way through here? Inferno Dragon in, Skelly Dragon's in, tons of pups, but the Archer Queen plus Inferno Dragon are just absolutely annihilating this push. Inferno Tower take care of the Love Hound. The Queen is taking care of those support units. Hog always getting a shot. Air Surfer needs to cycle back to another Love Hound and make another massive push. There goes the Lava in the back. Mighty Miner is blocking up this lane quite nicely. And Pandora's gonna set up with a very early Inferno Tower. I like that play. He wants to cycle back to a second Inferno Tower if needed. And it's far too late, of course, for Air Surfer to tower trade. So he's forced to play this game. Can he break on through? Inferno Tower very low. Pups tanking for a little bit. Zap, can the Loon get on there? Not gonna happen. Fireball a little bit late, and this Hog should get one shot, and it does. And the Queen is still alive. That three card cycle's activated. Pandora's gonna be back to another Hog Raider right away. There wow. it is. Can he defend? He gets the Tombstone and down in time. Pandora does have enough for the EQ, though, and I think this Hog might get another shot. And that's gonna be it. 141 on that left-hand tower. Just gotta cycle back and finish this thing off with spells. Air Surfer doing the best he can. Not gonna be enough. We're going to game number three. Game three, very exciting. Wow, I would love to see what decks these players are gonna bring out for this game three, especially with the duels formatting. There's a lot of cards out here. Let's answer them. Game number three, right now. Good luck's both directions, and of course, the gold rains on down up top. Bait for Pandora here. And you know, you like a lot about that call now with NATO out. Minor for Air Surfer. Minor versus bait matchup. This is fascinating. I would say most of the time, Minor is going to take that one just because you have the log, you have the fire spirit, really good counters to the goblin barrel. Whereas Pandora, really the only way to get damage is through rocket cycle. And you look at the, you saw the look on Pandora's face there when he saw the log come down. You know, that's interesting. You have to assume that Log hasn't been played in wow. game one and game two. You gotta assume Log's getting played. And Air Surfer just reading Pandora like a book. He has the Fire Spirit, the Log, and the Roll Delivery for that Goblin Barrel plus Dark Dog combo. All he has to do is cycle some Miners, chip away throughout the match, and I really don't see him losing this game. And Air Surfer is phenomenal, of course, at Miner Cycle, so in a pretty great spot here. So you talk about that. What does Pandora need to do to win in this game? Is it just give up very little damage early on and then cycle Rockets faster? And look at that. Rocket Cycle already here, still in single Elixir. Rock Cycle does come out. Air Surfer is also going to do that, so he is going to be matching that spell damage. Honestly, if I'm looking at Pandora's deck, I'm realizing this matchup. The only way that you could feasibly win this game is by quick Dark Obs like this, trying to catch your opponent off guard, or using that Mighty Miner three card cycle to get as many Goblin Barrels down as possible. We talked about everything. Air Surfer's one thing about his deck that is a weakness is he doesn't have a champion. No champion in here, so that that three card cycle at the end, no longer available for him. And this miner to pull back, Fire Spirit to help out. And you talked about that quick dark that quick dark goblin at the bridge. Air Surfer, ready, fast fingers. We've all missed that dark goblin at the bridge before. Not happening to Air Surfer. Absolutely, Pantor going for another Rocky here. This is the other thing about the champs. Not only can he try and outcycle with the Goblin Barrels, but he is playing that Rocket really early. Maybe he can get back to Rockets faster than Air Surfer can. And that's going to make getting these logs back out for Air Surfer more difficult as well as we get into now double Elixir and later on triple. Miner goes to the front this time. Varying that placement is Air Surfer. And for the moment, a nice lead here. 1464 to 2040. 
Another thing that Pandora has to do is he wants to save the Ice Spirit and Cycle specifically for the Miner. If you go for the Ice Spirit plus Mighty Miner combo, the Miner will never able to get any damage, and then you put yourself in a situation where it's just solely based on Rock Cycle. Dark Goblin getting some nice value there for Pandora. Log to clean things up and just trying to stay in this Rocket Cycle game right now is Pandora and the Fire Spirit plus Delivery wow. a half step late and now down to 908 on the left hand side. Air Surfer ahead, but that lead is getting smaller. This is very close. The Mighty Miner is down on the board. Pandora should be able to cycle back to Rockets a little bit quicker, but two Rockets. Is it going to be enough? I know it does 446. You need a rocket plus a log, and he doesn't have log in his deck. And log takes care of the Goblin Barrel. Miner on the tower. Air Surfer nearly back to it. Will we see the victory rocket? Not needed. Air Surfer wins this one in three. Huge reverse. Oh, not reverse sweep. Air Surfer won the first game. I do like how he's able to com keep his composure after losing that second match in Pandora. Game number one. You know, it's so interesting. Air Surfer does go to Golem more frequently than you might expect. Yeah, I think he is one of the only players that are really in CRL that do go to a Golem. Maybe we'll see Sweet play Golem here or there. It worked out for him in this situation, just mainly because of the Baby Dragon, though. Yeah, and that was absolutely huge for him onto deck number two. And this was when we were, this is the important one to talk about, right? You and I were thinking, hey, that normally Lava Loon would have a good matchup against Hog EQ AQ. Then the Inferno Tower, at least it had to have moved the needle, but Air Surfer still thought he had a good matchup there. Yeah, I think the main reason for that is the fact that Fire Spirit is not killing Lava Pups anymore, right? So even though the Inferno Tower is able to take out that main tank, the Archer Queen can only be cycled once. The Lava Pups, the Swarm of the Balloon, and the Skelly Drags can be difficult to stop, but Pandora did a great job of cycling defenses there. And then on to game number three, and great question by our compatriot Andrew about the pick there for Air Surfer at the end. He put Pandora on bait with that NATO being out, but Air Surfer still had log, and you saw, as once you saw that, you're like, Log, Royal Delivery, Fire Spirit, basically everything, a shutdown pick there for Air Surfer in that matchup. Absolutely. I think the other thing is just good analyzing, right? Because Pandora, one of his favorite win conditions is Goblin Barrel, it is bait. And like you said, with those certain things out of cycle, I think he was in his opponent's head in that situation. This is the Clash Royale League World Finals. I mean, let's go. So game one, the players are ready, remember, Winner moves on, loser goes home. Let's go. Arden at the top of your screen, I think, and Keith at the bottom, it appears. Ghost in the back from Keith. Skelly King gonna drop down to counter this. Tombstone is going to be filling up that Skelly King ability. E-Spirit, wouldn't be surprised to see an RG Mirror matchup, but the Skelly King Tombstone combo is so versatile, it really could be anything. Yeah, we see that with Lava Hound sometimes, but like you said, RG as well. And while it might be a little confusing for you at home, just a quick breakdown here. Humble Keith is at the bottom of the screen. Arkentoas is at the top. You can see the player names on the actual gameplay while the graphic is flip-flopped. We saw this matchup a little bit earlier with Molite versus KK. Keith going straight in with a Ghost Roll Giant at the bridge. Zappies and Hunter this time. Hunter instead of Mother Witch. That's definitely going to be a lot more useful in defense. Very solid stuff from Arden there. Easy, easy clean up there by Arden. Playing some very clean defense, which is exactly what he needs to do. He had a great game number one, but after that it was all downhill. Sweep really took control of that set. And it seems that both of them have had enough time to bounce back and collect their confidence. And there we go. Now it's Arden Toas, bottom of your screen. Humble Keith at the top, just to keep along with the action here. We like to keep you on your toes here at Clash Royale League. Absolutely. E-Spirit's going to keep Arden on his toes here, not able to get any damage there. Skelly King ability always going to be cleaned up quite nicely by either an E-Spirit or a Log. Royal Giant comes down for Arden. So again, Royal Giants meet each other here in this first game of our first elimination matchup. Fisherman going to drop here, going to counter this quite nicely. Is it going to be able to get this shot off? It does. Fisherman's going to be cleaned up. So a bit of a stop and stare here. Makes sense as we take into double overtime. Keith decides to set up in the back as we see Zappy split here for Arden. Arden may be paying a little bit more attention to the defense at the moment because of the push coming in. And then we'll see if he can turn that into a counter push. 
What we saw in the Molite versus KK matchup is Keith or Keith's side of things did have a fireball. I don't think that's what we're gonna see this time. Because we haven't seen the fireball drop yet. Yeah, that's a good point that you make, Juicy. And a bit surprising to see Ard run Royal Giant here. He hasn't had a lot of success, but only a 53% win rate for him. And then Keith on the other side of it, Royal Giant. Not really one of his favorite win conditions. Also, he's got a 38%. So you talk about that unpredictability. And look at that. Royal Ghost on the tower, Juicy. You never want that getting tanked for by the Royal Giant. Huge push there. Arden is doing his best to cycle these zappies, tombstones, stuff like that on the defense. But somehow, Keith is just able to apply insane amounts of pressure, get these logs on these tombstones. And he's got this tower down to 971, almost 1,000 damage lead as we head into overtime. Is it just overspends here by Arden defensively, or he's just not playing as efficiently as he needs to in terms of just defense, it seems? Because he's not getting much offense going. Yeah, I think you got to play your Zappies, you have to protect them more, especially when your opponent is not using the Fireball version. As you can see here, he's playing wow. Zappies so far up that the RG is always able to break through and get that shot. And the value from that log gets the Tombstone, gets the Skellies, hits two of the Zappies, and that's a mistake that you just cannot make here when you are fighting for your run in CRL. Lightning is going to make its appearance now. That's and we just it. need one more Lightning from Keefe to clutch up game one. And you see Arden Toast with a bit of a tilt of the head. And this is where things start to get really, really dicey. You dropped the first set. You dropped the first game of your elimination set. You got to stay confident, but it's so difficult to do that. Now just waiting for that Lightning to come in. Arden doesn't go for the block. He knows that he's not going to be able to block it long enough to turn that game around. And a quick early win here from Keefe, who played very well, I'd say, at the start of his set, but also found struggles later on. One thing I see from Keefe is just the aggression. He's always comfortable, he's always playing aggressive, and this time it's gonna end up working out, going against Arden, who played a little bit too passive in that match. Keefe is looking at maybe a bit of an upset right now as we go into game two. Yeah, you know, and it really does make sense, Arden being one of our golden ticket runners, but you gotta remember, Keefe had a glory run there at the end of our August qualifier. He was a quick 3-0 in stage five. He beat Sandbox, who actually sent him down to the elimination bracket earlier today. Keefe, he's a grinder, he's been practicing a lot. I actually chose him for this one because I thought that Arden just looked a little bit too nervous up there on that stage. Well, we'll find out right now. Going into game number two, Arden fighting for his life. Can he do it? Not a lot of story between the two of them, although Keith has gone 50-50 against all the competitors in the top 16 that he has played. So not too bad. And Drill coming out early on from Arden, so. Keith does pick it up with a tombstone, but those goblins were able to find a way to get some nice chip here. Lava in the back from Keith. Ghost same lane. Giant skill opposite. Does he have the Mighty Miner in tow here for this defense? Very aggressive play here. He needs to figure out a way. And the Ewis comes behind. This could be a good moment for Arden. He's got damage in both lanes. And the barbs completely ignore the giant skelly while the Royal Ghost goes to town on that left hand tower. Magic Archer very nicely placed in the middle here. If Keith doesn't have a fireball for it, it's going to get a lot of value. But fireball comes down. And now there's a counter push from Keith's side. Lava Hounds is is on the left here, but it's unsupported, and yeah. it's just not enough. And you can see there, Arden not worried about it all, maybe gonna NATO everything away here once that lava pops, but then you see the balloon coming in. Now NATO no longer an option, so we can see Cannon Cart in the pocket, just going for it is Arden Toas, and this is a big time swing from the younger of the two players who had his back up against the wall. Yeah, last match he was playing so passively, and now he's just going all out for sheer aggression on both sides. Not only does he take both Princess Towers, but that King Tower's down to 12, 20, 38. And I love that moment of Arden sitting there and going, maybe I'll NATO, maybe I'll NATO. Bloon comes in, fine, cannon cart in the pocket. Let's go, baby. Lava in the back from Keefe once again. Giant Skelly at the bridge, no waiting. Are we gonna be seeing some barbs on defense? Barbs should be coming down. There they are, right behind. Turn that giant skelly around. Make sure that death bomb does not get on tower. I don't know if I love that play, but there's not a lot else on the ground for Keith to defend with. So he goes Royal Ghost first in case you wanna see that tombstone drop down. And that is too much damage on that King Tower. This is gonna be a three crown win for Arden Toas. Lines up the magic archer, you love to see it. Fireball trying to keep that off the tornado. It's not quite enough, but it is going to be a three crown. We just need to see the what... lava's taking for the barbs. The lava Wait, is the barbs taking for the tower. barbs. The, the drill's drill, got to come the drill in. Needs one hit. The one hit. We need the NATO. What is going on? No way. way. Oh no way. Oh Are you kidding me? God. No. The two HP play. The two HP play. Arden Toas has been eliminated. I thought.
the game was over. He just needed one goblin hit from that drill, but the tombstone somehow was able to get those skeletons down and prevent that goblin from hitting. I flew out of my seat up here in the booth. I gotta fix my microphone, I gotta fix my hair. What is going on? That was what the, a play. <laughs> that was the craziest comeback I've ever seen. I mean, that's just one of those things. You see the barbs working down the lane. Arden got distracted by the light. He didn't realize that, that Lava Hound was taken for that entire set of barbs. You cannot leave five barbarians, a Lava Hound alone. <laughs> Juicy, I, you gotta talk me through this. I already lost my voice. All right, we got the Golden Eye and the ghost on this left-hand side, the Inferno Dragon is doing its best, and he goes for a fireball onto the Golden Knight. I think it was necessary or else that tower would have gone down. But now the Magic Archer comes out. He zaps Magic oh, Archer to prevent goodness. that one hit. The tornado was not enough, what? and do you know that Drill does 25 damage? Oh. The barbs are locked on, the loon is coming in, the tombstone, check this tombstone, one skeleton oh my was goodness. all that it took. The tombstone and Arden, you see his face, he's like, I cannot believe that Skelly just stole my world finals run. Keith stays alive and rich. <sighs> How you feeling? I'm I'm here. The two HP finish for Arden Toas, unfortunately, just falling a little bit short. You love to see that composure at the end of the game by Kiefer. Honestly, I think it was just a blessing from the Clash Royale gods. <sighs> <laughs> That's all you can do is take a huge breath and just try to recover from that. I mean, it, it, obviously you feel gutted for Arden, yes. young kid making his World Finals debut, Rookie of the Year level performance last year, great performances all around this year, but then you come up, you run into a, a tough matchup against a brilliant player like Sweep, and then just to have it so close right in your hands, on the other side of things, Chief Keefe now has come in, now Humble Keefe, has yes. come in two years in a row as a guy that people thought, should he really be here? But he repeated, came back again, and this kind of win, that cements a legacy. Absolutely, what a great day for Keefe. We'll obviously be seeing more of him tomorrow, but AC, we have another elimination match. Both of these players really paving the way for their legacy in their professional Clash Royale careers. Against Oslan, top of your screen, Turkey. Doom at the bottom here, Thus and Helsing. <laughs> Spear in the back, Giant Skelly, another Giant Skelly RG maybe. Mighty Miner could really be anything. Could be that Hog Mortar deck we've been seeing. Could be Bait, could be a Drill deck, could be a Miner deck, and a Mega Knight in the back. It's even a Mega Knight Rain Rider Mighty Miner deck. Doom having a lot of success in 2022 with a global tournament and ladder number one finish in May. Incredibly impressive to be able to pull that off and obviously showing that he's grinding like a madman. Mega Knight versus Giant Skeleton matchup right now. Any thoughts right off the bat, Juicy, of who has the favor in this matchup? I would say... I want to say that Aslan has a good favor here just because he has that Mighty Miner and he has the ability to make these very, very large pushes. Um, that could be very difficult to stop, especially if you don't have a building. The Fisherman... Fisherman can be very, very difficult um, when you're going against a Mighty Miner Mega Knight, Rain Rider push. <laughs> Doom and Gens Oslan have not faced each other in the competitive scene this year. And when Doom is running Royal Giant, he's got a 74% win rate. Ram Rider from Gens Oslan, maybe not one of his most popular decks. Big push on the left there. I thought it was going to be difficult to defend, but the fireball comes down, getting so much value, stopping that Ram Rider charge, cleaning out that Mother Witch, and the E Spear just to make sure that Giant Skelly has a lot of counter push value. And just a little caveat on that last piece of information there is while he does not play Ram Rider a lot, only five times in competitive, he does have an 80% win rate wow. with it. So going back to something that has worked in the past is the man from Turkey who is currently in the lead by just a hair. I really like that play, going for the Ghost, forcing out something on defense, something relatively yeah. expensive in this RG in the other lane. Oh, and the Mother Witch doesn't focus on the RG. You can see gets Oslan go, come on, man. RG getting big shots in, 15, 17. He goes hyper aggressive. Ram Rider at the bridge. That's fireball fodder for Doom. Log comes in, cleans up the bandit. And that is about as clean as it can get. What a great defense there. Fisherman just barely able to stop that Ram right in his tracks before it got taken out. Giant Skelly gets countered by very nice Liz. Liz is going to go to the opposite lane here, apply a little bit of a counter push value, maybe get a shot on this Hunter. So a little bit of a slow play at the moment. 
as Gantz Oslon tries to recover from that big time assault that came in based off of a overspend on a Mega Knight and a missed Mother Witch placement. Big push here on the left. E Spear is going to clean up this. Mighty Miner is going to take out this giant skeleton. Most of it. Not a whole lot of counter push value here. Seems like these players are kind of, you know, jostling back and forth. But Dominic has a very nice damage lead. Oslan really needs to find a way to build that really big push and then bait out the fireball and then go in even harder after it comes out. And I really like what Doom is doing here in terms of just slow playing this game. He's not getting too aggressive. He knows he has the massive damage lead. He knows he doesn't have to worry about the spell cycle game. He can just really sit back, sit pretty, and defend for the next 85 seconds. Absolutely. Big push on the right hand side here just to try and apply a little bit of pressure. And that bandit still just not getting what Gens Oslan wants out of this. He's trying to snipe that Hunter off the board. Hunter actually takes out the bandit, stays alive. Doesn't get a lot out of it, but what he does, does get is three wasted elixir from his opponent, which is a big deal. Blog gonna come in late. And he's just blocking up this lane on this right hand side. Giant Skeleton, still one of the best defensive cards in the game. Yeah, I don't know what his plan is here. There's just no way that he can do. So Big here, double giant skelly push going on. Side. Royal giant coming down. Giant skelly almost getting to the tower. And it does. It gets all wow. down. 184 remains in a dominant game number one there from Doom. He got the lead early on, made a big swing there, and then there was just no way to recover because, like you said, just clogging up that lane. And it looks like we were uh, we did okay for ourselves up here, Juice. We were right. Yeah, I think the other thing with the Giant Skelly is maybe it doesn't have all of that health, but it still does quite a bit of damage per hit. And yeah. Yeah, he was just really good on defense, just generally. So here we go. Can Gens Oslan bounce back in game number two? Let's find out. I am incredibly curious to see what deck they both run in game number two. You know, uh, we saw Gens Oslan go down early. In the start of the day, he went to his comfort. He went mortar. Doom doing kind of the same thing, except for there was that little twist in the hog rider. But unfortunately for him, he wasn't able to have that surprise factor. We'll see what he decides here. And Sazlan starting off with a bar barrel. And Bowler. it looks like Dominic could be going back to what he ran in game number one, Lumberloon Freeze. Lumberloon Freeze. The other thing we might be thinking about when we see a bowler is a graveyard. Yep. But I would say you're probably right with that one. Cannon Cart's on the defense from Aslan. Cannon Cart does a very nice job versus the bowler. Most likely going to be seeing a bridge spam sort of drill deck here, or maybe even a beatdown deck after seeing this baby dragon. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you look at the numbers here for Doom, you, you really don't ever see him run Juwai. It makes sense he wants to go to the skies. That is where his comfort is. So he goes right back to this. And for all you fans of World Finals, this deck is uh, kind of cemented in history, if you will. Absolutely. I don't even want to talk about that we World don't have, Finals. We don't have to talk about it. <laughs> But Golden Knight Dash. Wow, Baby right Dragon's still here. alive. And so you see that NATO have to come down. We see against Oslan tick to 10 as Doom is just getting to 5 6. So a Golem here in the back right side. And, you know, Golem has not been very successful at all in CRL, but we did see Air Surfer have great success earlier today. This deck has a special place in my heart. This is the deck that I use, or a similar one to use, at my World Championship win there. Uh, with the E-Drag. Gold Knight going to be coming in here. Very, very nice addition to the deck. It really synergizes with that Tornado. What a fun little flex. <laughs> At my world championship that I won. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the Lightning version, though. No E-Drag. I think the Lightning is also going to be very, very good addition to this deck. Helping take out those E-Drags. Without the E-Drag in the board for Dominic, defending can be very difficult. Yeah, uh, I mean, 100%. And you look here again at where we're at in the Elixir conversation, and the damage very, very much different. So, yes, Doom most likely going to switch lanes, and he does. Inferno Drag over there. Boulder on the right for the Golden Knight. Are we going to see a Lumberloon on the left-hand side here? Jen is already getting ready for that possibility with his big dragon here. He decides to go with Lumberjack in the back instead, but look at these air units stacked on the left-hand side. Oh, wow, and it does connect. So a big 
big piece of fortunate wow. interaction there. And the lightning comes in, and that should be towered down. No, Doom decides to stop the bleeding. He pulls it back. Golden Knight does not get another hit, as this Mega Minion should get three to four on the other side. That's the third. There's the fourth. 1488 to 373. And I think the thing here is Gets Ozlan recognizes, look, I have the damage lead. He doesn't have a big spell. He can only NATO back. I don't need to get another Golem down. And that's exactly what he's doing, over-defending and being aggressive with cheaper cards. And, yeah, that's the thing about the lightning, right? Yeah. It's just so instantaneous. You always have to be aware that that lightning could come down. I just don't think that Dominic was ready for that possibility. Trying to pull it all together to freeze, so we see Gens Aslan pull it all back with a NATO. That is a game-saving NATO in my mind from Gens Aslan. Really, really nice defense there. Gold Knight in the back. You really just need one more lightning and tornado to finish off this game. So we'll see how Gens Aslan wants to hammer this nail in the coffin and take us to game number three. Doom looking to make a miracle. Freeze getting some decent value here, but the E-Drag is not chaining onto the Mega Minion, so that is going to be a dead E-Drag at this point. Kind of just a desperation tornado. I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of a lightning cycle, a little bit of tornado cycle here as we finish up this match. And that NATO actually a really good call. Again, when you look at where Doom is at and his elixir just thirsting to defend, Oslan just keeping up the pressure. Game number three, person number two will be eliminated. Good luck. Wipe of the hand for Doom. Ice Spear at the bridge, picked up by some bats. Bats, we saw him play earlier in a mortar deck. We'll see if he goes right back to it. Obviously, Bats are played in other decks as well. Both players looking <laughs> some Elixir, Musketeer here. I, I think you're I right. Th I do think I'm right. And the question is, did Doom play that mind game, or did he not? We'll see what the matchup is here very shortly. Beta at the bridge trying to pick up that Musketeer, but the Skarmie's wow. going to come down. And ability is forced to pop. I really, really like the Mega Knight. I like that Mega Knight, too. That's a great play there. Skeleton King gets the lead. Both towers here focus on that Skeleton King, but more defense must come in. So Skelly's pop to distract the MK. Miner goes right to that Archer Queen, and we're set right back at zero. Although, we do see a little bit of damage done to Dom's side. Four Elixir to defend. Mortar comes in. Mortar does come down. Rain Rider gonna get some decent shots on it and take it out. Dominic's up a bit of elixir here. Wonder what he's gonna do with it. Most likely we're gonna see a roll of ghost in the back here if I had to guess. Oslan ticking to seven. Doom is gets to nine. And an ice spirit at the bridge just for a little bit of pressure. And bats do come in. Oslan goes, no, I'd like to keep these towers very healthy. Thank you very much, sir. Bandit in the back, gonna maybe try and not let that happen. A snowball on the bandit just to chip away. Most likely we're gonna be seeing a Skarmy back in hand for this. And I'm very glad that he did play his Skarmy, but he played it in the center of the map. Last time we saw it right up at the bridge, you gotta change up your placement. We saw the success of that earlier today with Morton changing up the placement on his Skarmy. Obviously, one of the cards in the game that when you get a zap or a log or a, uh, a snowball on top of, it's incredibly effective, but... Uh, Play it in the same spot, you're setting yourself up for failure. Absolutely. Queen gonna die to the Skelly King build here, not able to protect her musketeer on the defense. Rain Rider Mega Knight pushes, bats getting taken out, and we're adding to a mini yeah. packet to this as well. Wow, and this is fascinating. That miner's coming in to turn everything around, but still, that's three elixir that goes to no man's land. Against Oslan could be in trouble. He spends down to zero with a Mini P.E.K.K.A. and a Bandit on the board. Snowball comes in just in time. Pressure through the roof. Mini P.E.K.K.A. will not get a hit. Snowball, or excuse me, Ice Spirit does a great job on those bats. And against Oslan is reeling. Ram Rider getting so much damage here. Now Dominic's in the situation where he's just going to be able to clog up this right-hand lane. Oslan needs to be thinking about pressuring this opposite lane if he wants to get anything done in this match. Sets up a mortar defensively to deal with this Mega Knight plus Bandit push coming down the right-hand lane. Queen up high here. We, I would love to see a big spell from Ozlon on this Archer Queen. He decides to go for the Skarmy, fill up the Skelly King ability, drop that Skelly King ability. That's doing a very nice job of defending. Very, really nice micro from Dominic, though, with his Ice Spirits keeping this Queen very healthy. Delaying on the ability as much as possible to get a lot of value taking out this Musketeer. And Muskie will go off the board, and so does the AQ as he cycles a Miner in the back. And most likely that big spell is probably Poison. We haven't seen it come out yet as he leaks just a couple Elixir there. And Dominic's just continually applying pressure. He's yep. got two Magnites on the board. He's got a Ram Rider. 
And with this pressure, it's never giving Ozlon a chance to go on offense. Look, he's always using those miners on defense and the mortars on defense. Yeah, I think the biggest issue here is his highest DPS troops are just not on the board long enough, like the Musketeer. But then when you talk about the highest DPS troops that you expect to go down quickly, like the Skeleton Army or the Bats, they're just not getting a lot of value, which is the biggest problem. So you see, that is a perfectly timed snowball. Not going to give any souls away. Takes everything off the board. Arch Queen going to cross still. So Doom really just playing great as we get to 65 seconds remaining here in this final game number three winner moves on loser either goes home or stays at home who knows you really made a good point there about the archer queen and just protecting her and also like using her spells to clear out those counter pushes he's always been able to clean up the counter push with the arch queen ability and that's what's made it so he's continually able to apply that pressure. And it's crazy, too, because you look at how much Swarm Gens Ozlon has and how much single-target DPS, you know, Dominic has, but he's been doing a very good job, like you said, using those snowballs and especially that AQ as she does exactly what we're talking about, cleaning up those bats. 25 seconds remain. Gens Ozlon needs a miracle. And the desperation mortar of the bridge on the left and lane. He does force out the Mega Knight. Mini Peck is going to clean up wow. the Skelly King, though. And that big push, that all-in desperation push, doesn't really seem like it's going to mount to much. And while he did not make his way to Helsinki, he doesn't have a very long trip home. Against Oslan is eliminated from our 2022 World Finals. He still gets a pretty paycheck of $20,000. But I imagine Doom has a lot to say after a very, very interesting earlier part of the day. Obviously, with the mask on, we'll have to catch up with him tomorrow. But I'm sure he'll probably have some things to say on Twitter, so go ahead and give him a shout and see what the winner of our second elimination match has to say today. And, you know, any thoughts that really stand out to you in that set? I mean, it looks like we were right. Dominic did hey. take the win. Um, there it is. <laughs> let's go. Honestly, for that set, once again, it was just the arch screen protection. The use of the spells, I think one of the most important things there is at the end, he decided not to use the lightning on the tower. He cleaned up two musketeers, the yep. mortar. He just controlled the match after getting that very early damage lead. And that's what all it took to get that victory. Doom moves on. Let's see the tape. All right, Juicy, talk me through this. Mega Knight, Raymire, Mini Pekka push on the right. Miner does come down to try and force those units forward. Mortar going to come down. And the Skarmy is placed before the Skelly King. I think that's the most important thing here. Now the Skelly King is here without the use of an ability. And it's going to drop to the Mini Pekka. Dominic realized how much Elixir he's up. He realized that he could continually apply that, apply that pressure. And that was what we were talking about. That was the early damage that he got. And for the rest of the game, it was very simple. Good defense and good prevention of counter push. Juicy, favorite moments of the day for you. Favorite moments of the day, the upset when Mo lost. I really like the 2 HP win from Keith as well. And overall, just the matches, watching the favorites do their thing, win those games. It was a lot of fun overall. I had a blast. Oh, yeah, that 2 HP match was absolutely crazy. And you love that the moms are bringing the good luck here for our competitors. We'll obviously be back tomorrow. What a day. Absolutely. Uh, an amazing day. We saw the second closest finish in CRL World Finals history, 2 HP. Josh, how did that one make you feel? I was so excited behind the scenes. I really hope that they were able to capture that. It was just, we, we saw this before. Oh, it only does 25 HP. It only does 25 HP. Two left. And then the win. It was a wild one. And we are not done yet. We're back tomorrow with day two. On behalf of everyone here at CRL, that's Joshua AC Sharon, Jackson Juicy J Wall, Andrew Guy, I'm Rich Slayton. We'll see you back here tomorrow for day two of CRL World Finals.